My name is Gary Cole and you're listening to the Football Coaching Life, a podcast brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and Making Media, the podcast professionals. This is a special live recording to launch, to launch Football Coaches Australia partnership with Global Institute of Sport, and this has been facilitated by the League Managers Association in the UK. A big welcome to the GIA students and Australian coaches tuning in. We are truly honoured today to be talking with Harry Kuehl. Harry needs no introduction, particularly if you're an Aussie and a football fan, but let's do a quick summary anyway. An incredible professional career of over 400 games in Europe with 100 goals, played in Europe with three huge clubs at Leeds United, Liverpool in the EPL and Galatasaray in Turkey. Harry did come back to Oz for a short time and played with my old club, Melbourne Victory and, and Melbourne City, but incredibly played 58 times for the Socceroos, and that probably would have been a lot more without injury, Harry. Scored 17 goals across five World Cup campaigns, played in two World Cup finals in Germany, and who's ever going to forget that goal against Croatia, and of course uh, in South Africa. And far too many personal um, honours to mention here, but it'd be remiss of me to, if I didn't mention that UEFA Champions League winner's medal he's got in his back pocket, the Medal of the Order of Australia, inducted into the Sport Australia Hall of Fame, the Asian Hall of Fame, and perhaps more importantly, selected by Australian football fans as Australia's greatest ever footballer. Welcome to the show, Harry Kiel. <laughs> That's some introduction. Thank you. <laughs> hey, I had to cut it short, mate. I had oh, to cut it short. Well, hey, look, I'm, I'm blushing here. <laughs> uh, we'll get over that. We'll get over that. Now, listen, I, I saw your, your gaffer, Ange, touch down in Sydney today, but I'm assuming you're in sunny downtown Glasgow? Uh, well, no, because um, it's international break, um, a lot of our players have gone away with the national team. So I was allowed to um, come home for the week. So it's and it's kind of fitted in well because it's kind of my birthday week as well. So <laughs> it's been nice to uh, come back home and, and spend it with my family, even though they've yeah. all gone off to school now and doing their own thing. So I'm actually left all home alone. So that's why the whiskers are off as well. So the family recognise her? Yes, yes, yes. The beard's off. I'm not up there and uh, shouting and hollering. I'm down here clean cut shaven. <laughs> Love it. All right, let, let, let's get the show on the road, H. I know that your um, your football campaign started with Smithfield um, Smithfield Hotspurs in the west of Sydney, which is an incredible breeding ground for for football talent. But where did you fall in love with the game? I think there's a few kind of stories out there uh, of how I fell in love with the game, and, and may you know I, I've may have told one here and one there. But as far as I can remember, my my mum always used to turn around and say, I always love to kick things around. You know, whether that was a ball or whether it was a, uh, a, a can or anything, just needed something to kick around. Um, I suppose the, the love of football, though, um, probably came from playing against my brother, you know, because my brother played it. So I kind of was the... Uh, I'm, I'm the second one, so I'm the younger one. So I've always want to be competing and trying to beat my brother. So that's yeah, probably man. where it, it came from. You know, wanted to play with him, doing one v ones, with things like that. Going to the same um, Smithfield Hotspurs. He was, uh, I think, he's for example, he was like under tens, and I was under eights. So we were always playing at the same venue. Just times were different. He was a right winger, I was a left winger. So these are all things that kind of, kind of merged into it. Um, but then it just kind of grabbed me, you know, yeah. that this sport, you know, what you could uh, do with with a ball with, you know, the, the first pass, because a lot of sports are handball coordination. You can use your hands a lot, where this yeah. one is, except for the goalkeeper, you can't. You have to physically use your feet. And it's, it's, it's a difficult game, but it's a fantastic game if you understand it, if you're yeah. willing to, to work at it. Uh, it's a great game to play. So with you with your brother was a lot was a, a lot of that competition happened in the backyard. Oh well, yeah, front garden, front <laughs> garden. Him and his mates, and I think that helped me because yeah. I was always playing older older guys, older uh, and always competing. And even when I started to get into my academies, my brother still trained with me. You know, yeah. and he would make me laugh, and he'd, he'd be trying all these tricks and all that. Uh, so he'd always be pushing me in that way, but. I think the the love of it was 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 there straight away, but I had to work very hard at it. Yeah, Westfield Sports High was uh, 
pretty unique um, because it decided to offer students uh, an opportunity to study and play the sports they loved. Was there an influence? Did Westfield's, Westfield Sports High help you grow and develop as a footballer? Well, when I finished uh, primary school uh, and then went to high school, my first year was in St. John's Park. So I remember going there, uh, doing year seven and, you know, doing my, my Marconi and my academy and all that. But then when Westfield Sports High opened up uh, the kind of football side of it and offered me a, um, a scholarship, I thought it was um, a no-brainer. You know, my parents thought it was a good idea. I was training with the same coach who trains me uh, up at my uh, upper park, Lee, David Lee. So David Lee. it was just me getting extra training. And the fact that I get to go in early to school and train and then go do my, do my studies and then even after be able to play it, it was just... Well, living the life really, you know, as, as I loved, I loved going to school for football, you know, yeah. <laughs> schoolwork wasn't as uh, much as my high priority, um, but I still had to do it because if my grades weren't right, then I could be easily kicked out of the, the scholarship. So I had to make sure everything was uh, uh, in top form for me to progress. Yeah, that's a great model, isn't it? It's a fantastic model, but again, you have to work at it. Yeah. You know, you just can't be given anything. I think you have to, well, I knew from a a, a, a younger age that, you know, there's a lot of doors that can be opened if you worked hard. And, yeah. you know, I, I kind of took that straight away. Yeah, you certainly did. And, and obviously then had the opportunity to go into the Leeds United youth system and, and continue that development there. Yeah, which was an eye-opener because we didn't get too much English football when I was growing up. You know, you only used to see it on the ABC yeah, for about 45, half an hour to 45 minutes. Uh, yeah. So to, to really go over there, and I, I, I still remember as fresh as day that me and Brett Emerton going over there and having, having the chance only to, to, to see what it's like to be a YTS, uh, a young player, a young footballer over in England to, to see what they get up to day in, day out. You know, the lead up to their game, not only to their game, but also the Premier League game. And it was just fascinating. I loved it. I loved the, the smell of it. I loved walking into a, the, you know, Ellen Road at the every day, the, the smell of football. That's what yeah. I wanted. And yeah, I, I, I ended up playing a game for, for Leeds at the end of that. And that's when they decided to sign me. Yeah. Harry, in terms of an environment, is that... When you're a young kid from another country and you have arrived in a in your new country and, and you're looking to develop and grow as a player and hopefully get a pro contract, is that a warm, fuzzy, welcoming, welcoming environment, or do you have to do you have to work your way through to establish yourself in that environment? <laughs> no, it's not a warm, uh, <laughs> fuzzy feeling. It is. It is. It's. It's. It's, it's a ruthless job. I'm not going to lie, it's it's tough, I mean, even when you're 15, 16, because you have to understand you're coming into a country where, like, in Australia, where we're, we're given five or six sports equipments, you know, whether it's a rugby league ball, cricket bat, golf club, tennis bat, anything, and yeah. we can do that. Over here, they're just, all the, all the, all the boys and, and the girls have just been given footballs because that is their sport. So you're coming into an environment where you're going to be taking one of their places. And they're not going to open, open you up with uh, welcoming moms. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're, they're friendly, but they're not going to be sitting here going, well, you can take my place because, you know, yeah. I'll go do something else. No, you have to fight for it. And from the, yeah. the moment I, I got here, I, I, I stood up to myself. I, I stuck up for myself. I was very respectful. I made sure all my stuff off the field was done. And then when I was on the field, I made sure I gave everything. And the one thing that, no one would ever argue is if they can see you given a hundred percent, you know, and you fail, they can see that there's there's someone that wants to work on that and make them better. So, and that's what I did. I, I had areas of my game that I needed to work on, and I stayed out longer than anybody else working on that to make sure that when an opportunity came to whether that was to play in the youth team, whether that was to have a chance in the reserve team, or even have a sniff of training with the first team. These are the moments that you have to be ready for and you have to be training that. And like I said, no one's going to do it for you. You have to, you have to do it. Yeah. Now, th thanks for sharing that.
Appreciate it. All right, enough about your uh, enough about your playing career. We're here to talk about coaching and managing footballers. So, H, where were you on your journey when you you thought that coaching post playing might be an option for you? Well, for me, I when I was playing football, everyone was, "Oh, what are you going to do after football? This, that, and the other." And I, I actually said, "I, I can't concentrate on that. You know, I, I've got to concentrate just on my football." because I want to enjoy that. You know, I'm, I've never been good at doing two things at once. I'm only as good as doing one thing, and that's how I just concentrated on football. So as far as coaching, it never entered my mind. Uh, as far as doing anything outside of football, it never really entered my mind. I was always focusing on football. But when my time came uh, that I retired, I, I think I sat around for about a couple of months, and I thought, well, I might as well do my license just to just to see it's like you know you get your driver's license well i might as well get them just in case and i remember going on the course and the the course was for two weeks the first one and it was the b license and i remember sitting there going through it and listening and going okay yeah i get this because i could always understand football you know i I was always i was always one of these players that could move into different positions tell one of my players to go somewhere else and to create space or find gaps and then i remember sitting in this uh in the lobby and we all had to make uh, our own session, our very first yeah. session. So, and we're doing it in front of our peers. And I remember my, my one was defending crosses. I was thinking, ah, oh, well, I put crosses in all my life. I know where the danger area is, so this can't be too hard. <laughs> and I, I remember, I remember taking the session and honestly, it felt natural. It was the, when you talk about a fire in your belly, when I played the game, I used to have this fire in my belly. When I took that first session, there was like that blue flame just burning away there. And I just went, wow. And I remember pulling people around, making sure these are the areas I want you to defend once they come in there. And I just made, and one, I remember one of the players coming up to me afterwards and go, you know what? I'd play for you. And that then just went, wow, this is, and from ever, from that moment on, I was sitting in my room creating ideas, want to create a formula, I want to create different ways of playing, structure, all that kind of, and, and like I said, I just love the, the fact that I can create things now and, you know, I can then pass it on. Yeah. So you finished playing at Melbourne Heart and I think you went back to Sydney, I'm not sure of the timeline, and, and started your own academy. Did, did, you, did you get your coaching licence, start your licences in the UK or, or in Europe? Yeah, or, I, got my, uh, I got mine um, through uh, the Northern Ireland. Uh, They were a fantastic group of people, um, which they help a lot of players uh, progress their coaching career. But even when I was doing the uh, the academy back in Australia, for some reason, I'm 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 not a very patient person when it comes to driving, or when it's just coming to little things. But you put me on a football pitch, and you put me with someone that doesn't even know how to kick a ball. I can physically break it down to them to the point where they'll stand still where their ankle is. And I enjoy it. I actually yeah. enjoy it. I enjoy it. I could stay there all day teaching this one person just to strike a ball. And then the feel of enjoyment you get when they actually succeed in doing it, it's 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 a buzz. Yeah. No, I, I love that a lot. So where was your first coaching opportunity? My first coaching opportunity came at Watford, uh, the under 23s. Um, I got a call. Uh, from a friend of mine and said, what for the looking for an under 23s coach? I just uh, received my A license and I went, oh, fantastic. Um, I said, look, I'll take it only if I can speak to the manager. And that was Kike uh, Flores at the time. And <laughs> it makes me laugh now because managers now would have been like, yeah, and don't worry about it. Yeah, do it. <laughs> anyway, I, I said, look, because I don't want to, I want to get an idea of what he wants so I can do because I don't want to create something of my own and it's not, you know, in with the yeah, first team. Yeah. And I remember sitting down with Kike and I said, look, Kike, look, I'm, I'm here. I want, I want to enjoy this, but what do you want from me? And he turned around and said, nothing. You just concentrate on your players and I'll concentrate on mine. I went, cheers, wow. and walked out. <laughs> but I think that was, that was like, that was fun because I had now a clean slate of, uh, a clean slate where, and don't get me wrong, I had 10 players then I had 14 players, then I could have seven players. So I've always had to be adaptive. Yeah. But my, my number one role, which I'd never forgotten, was the fact that it wasn't about me producing a way 
to play football, it was about me progressing my players into the first team. Yeah. So what I had to do. So a lot of my training was very basic, um, but structured around making my players better to be able to, when they get that opportunity to go into the first team, they were ready. Um, so I think we came second last both years I was there, but I had the top goal scorer and we used to play free throwing football. Yeah. You know, and I ended up making five players making their Premier League debut. So I, I take that as as a as a positive. Yeah, absolutely. Because that 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 is your role. Because your role is not about, oh, it's all about me. This is the way I want to play. You you've got to be able to prepare these players for when they get called off, that they're ready. And that's that's how I looked at that role. And yeah. I absolutely I love that role. It was uh it was good, but I felt it was time for me to uh, move on and yeah. get a te- get a team of my own, and see what you know what all the fuss is all about. Really, <laughs> H, how how important was that first gig in being out on the grass every day, working with the players, as you say, adapting to some days I've got seven, some days I've got eighteen or twenty, whatever it is. How important was that for you to develop as a coach, as a manager? Well, again, the only time I've had experience was this when I was on my coaching courses. So I was learning a lot of this as as I was going along. But again, like you put me in an office with computers and fax machines and all that, and something goes wrong, I'd be all over the place. But for some unknown reason, you put me on a field and I could be doing a drill with 12 players and then next minute I get a call that three players have got to go. I can adapt that training session like that and to make everyone feel that they're still working hard. I can adapt yeah. even if they take eight players and I've only got three left, I can still make them three players feel that special that they're going to work that hard and make themselves better that day. I don't know why or how, it just it just comes to me. Mate, that's a gift. Hang on to that one for as long as you can. Yeah, I like like I said, it's, it's sometimes it amazes me because yeah. I just think like, and I, it's, it's, the way I see coaching is not about having a structure. I, I, I like to actually look at players. I, I, I look at the way they move. I look at the way what they contribute in a game. And I, I, I pick two or three things which I think can help them become a better player. And that's what I work on, their movements. Because I it, it does strike me sometimes where you see teams play possession games or anything like that but they don't really work on specifics for individuals or even individuals in groups, what they do on a weekend. You know, I was always a a big person who needed to take people on, right? So I needed to take at least 50 people on during the week that come on the weekend. I knew what I was doing. It was natural. You know, it just, oh, I haven't done it. Oh, here we go. I'm supposed to do it. No, you've got to make sure you're prepared that come Saturday, you're ready to ready to be able to do it. And that's what I like. Harry, I'm, I'm curious to see who had the most influence, which coach had the most influence or coaches had the most influence on you as a player. I, I was going through today that there's George Graham, David O'Leary, Terry Venables, Peter Reid, Raul Blanco, Terry Venables, Frankie Farina, Gus Hiddink, Arnie, Pim Verbeek, Holger Osiek. There's been a raft of um, very different very different sort of coaches. I think you also had a relationship with my old mate, Dr. Ron Smith. Um, I'm just curious, you know, which, which coach coaches had the most influence you as a player, first and foremost? I can't believe you left. You, I, I think you left about two off there, but the, the, the one <laughs> main one. The Liverpool, the Liverpool guy, so sorry. <laughs> no, no, you still left one more off who I thought, like, I, when I... When I worked with this manager, I first and foremost I was a fan because I, I I wasn't a fan of a lot of of, of a lot of players because I always wanted to create my own identity, but yeah. these three were uh, uh, players that I admired and I got to work with one of them. I've met I've met the other two, uh, but I got to work with this one over at Galatasaray, uh, Frank Rijkaard. Yeah, and the way he saw football, like the way I saw football was kind of the similar way that he saw it, but he kind of zoomed it out just that little bit more. And I used to love having my conversations with him uh, about football because the way he spoke about it was coming from someone like me. And I just, I I got on really well with him and I played some of my my best football of my life under him. 
And it wasn't that he started me all the time. He would always push me in these little areas that got the best out of me. But like I said, it was the way that he saw football that got me intrigued. Yeah. And 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 I, I, I liked that because I always wanted to be challenged at work. You know, I didn't want to go to work and it was just, okay, this is what we're doing. I needed something. Otherwise, like I said, I, I go crazy. You know, I, I, I wanted I wanted to be challenged, whether that was mentally or physically on the pitch. You know, I, I wanted to be put in awkward positions, you know, and yeah. and I wanted to figure out the answer to myself. But if I couldn't figure out, I wanted someone to show me. And he was yeah. he was like that. Yeah, you've you've got to love what you do, don't you? If you can yeah. develop. Yes. Yeah. So what then is coaching? For me. Coaching is understanding something and being able to physically or mentally teach someone that wants to learn a trade uh, and to be able to show them uh, certain parts of it. Because I don't think you can sit there and say, look, I'm going to make you the best ever player. No, because that's got to come from within the, the person. That's got to come within the athlete. I think you can only guide him and put him in to a, uh, in, in a certain routine where then he can he can blossom himself. Yes, you can help him by, you know, helping him by watching the games, uh, helping him on the training field. But ultimately, it's down to the actual individual first and foremost. You're there as a guidance, you know, because you've been yeah. there, you've seen it. Uh, you can give him maybe little bits of tips. But again, it's not about you. You've got to forget about you. You've got to give it. It's, it's all about that person and that person's got to know that it's about him and if he wants to you know progress that he he's he's the one that's going to have to put the hard work in and you can only help him on his way yeah yeah i like i like, like that I, I was listening to a, a business podcast um, a while ago now but it, it was interesting they were talking about the difference between um aspirant capability and i thought Bloody hell, that's, that's a great question for coaches because we, we hear a lot about, you know, you've got to have a philosophy and I'm going to play this, this way. And that's great, but you can arrive at a club at a point in time that may have great resources or no resources, a group of players that looks like this, um, and might have this picture of what it is you want to do and how you want to play. But today, this is what we've got. I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that, that, that different between Aston and, and the capability of where we are today. Sorry, you just cut out there, Gary, a little bit there, just oh. with the, the question. Sorry. Sorry. So you are. No, asking... that's, that, that's okay, mate. Yeah, when, when, when we arrive as a coach or a manager, we've got this philosophy about how you want to play for it very, very yep. clear. But you can arrive at a, at, a, at a club and you've got these are the resources you've got, this is the budget you've got, these are the current players you've got. And current organisation has a capability to do this. How do you how do you see that working, and how do you help take what you've got to be able to get to? Does that make well, sense? Yeah, no, it it, it makes um, sense because you, you're right. You you go into a club, and they always say, you know, don't, you know, it, just give it time. You know, work with work with what you got have a structure, figure out what needs to be done. And in a period of three years, they say, you should be able to have your own team, All right? And, you know, so you just kind of ease it into it. Look at the best managers going around now. Like, uh, let's just take uh, Pep Guardiola, uh, Jurgen Klopp, and even uh, my manager, Ange. They've all walked into their clubs and they've played exactly the way that they wanted to play from day one. They don't care what players they've got. They don't care what structure they have, what anything. It's their way. That's how they want to play. And you know what? Sometimes it doesn't work, but eventually you get there. And you probably get there quicker than you think because you, you, you believe in your way. And the one thing that players want, right, and players will see through coaches if, they, if the coaches don't believe in what they're doing. And it's got to be original. It's got to be your ideas because I'll tell you, we will see through it. You've got to believe in your idea that much that the player thinks, well, he believes in it, so of course I'm going to believe in it. So I actually believe that you can go straight in there 
if you have the courage, because there's going to be a lot of people looking at you going, well, hey, don't be changing too much. I mean, let's take, for example, the, 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 the Brighton manager coming in now. And I was just hearing on uh, Talk Sport there that they're telling him that I wouldn't change a thing. Just go in there and uh, don't do anything. It's like, well, okay, he could do that and he could win or let's just say he doesn't change it and he could lose and he could get the sack. And he'd be thinking, they're going, well, how come I didn't do it my way? I think yeah. you have to take you, – you don't become a manager or a coach because it's easy. It's a tough job. You know, because you have every single person criticizing you, you know, because everyone has an opinion about how you should play, what players you should be playing, what players should be signing, this and that. So you have to have, you have, to have this self-belief in you to go there and say, well, yeah, I know what you're like. I know what your team's like, but this is me. This is why the club's bought me to change it. Now, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't, you don't have three years. Like if you were to say to me, look, you can get a club. Uh, you've got three years. Don't touch anything at the moment, right? Don't touch anything of the players or anything. And you've got three years, right, to transfer. I'd go, okay, cool. But you don't get that. You've got to go in there and you've right. got to make your, your stamp straight away. And like I said, these the managers that have, uh, are winning things and are successful, they go in there straight away and they they, they put a stamp on they, what they want to do, how they want to play, what they, want, what, is, what they demand of their players. And they put it from day one and they do not change. Yeah. You've got to be you. You have to be. You have to be. Yeah. yeah. No, I like that again. Has your coaching changed or how has your coaching changed over your journey? Um, yes. I think it's uh, changed because the, the, the journey that I've gone down, uh, where when I, when I first took over at Crawley, uh, to what I wanted to do, and then to be able to progress from there to um, go from Crawley to be, get bought from Notts County, then to be kind of thrown out straight away for no reason at all, then to get another job and to be part of a club that's building, that's only had four players at the start, then to get thrown out again. I mean, I got thrown out of clubs because of not the players or not even the results. I got thrown yeah. out by sporting directors. And like I said... Everyone should be accountable, right? And yeah, I, I'm yeah. the first one to put my hands up and say, hey, you know, if I'm, if I'm bad, I'm bad, right? But sometimes people ask the impossible. Now, I, I like a tough job. There's no question about it. I like to be able to create and, and, and to see change. And the one thing that you get, especially at the levels that I've coached at, is you get fantastic players, players that have had troubles throughout their lives, but wanting to learn. And if you want to learn, by all means, come. And I'll make you a better player to go out there and progress your career. It's just unfortunate you you got to deal with people that may have never played the game. Yeah, I think they do. You know, yeah. it's and and that's that's the tough part. So that's yeah. that's the side that I'm I'm learning more about. You know, yeah. it's it's not so much the coaching side because I have my ideas and I don't think I I I've never followed anyone in football when I played. And I, yeah. I will sure as hell won't follow anybody in the way that they uh, play. I will always have my own ideas. Yes, you may take one or two little ideas from different coaches and you can merge them up and then maybe just change it a little bit here or there. But ultimately, I'll, I'll have everything the way that I want it on the pitch. But yes, learning so much more of what goes on outside the pitch is, 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 is difficult. Yeah. I, I think one of the things we've talked about uh, on the show regularly is the when, when I think it's fair for most of us when when you take over as a head coach or a manager you don't know what you don't know we think as players you know we've got a fairly good grasp of what goes on but it's in most cases it's certainly true that you you don't know what you don't know and the other thing is leading that group of players and the support staff around you that seems to be the easy bit but the learning of the skill to manage up seems to be the place that that you know all of us need to learn we've all got to get better at that because we we don't necessarily control what goes on in those positions no I, and like i said i'm i can understand uh if you're an owner of a club and that's, it's your club and you've played the game at the highest level and you know the ins and outs i i would get it you know it just sometimes it's just it's, look it's unfortunate 
You know, it's 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 like me going into uh, say Apple and working behind the genius bar. Now I have no idea, but I'll just take a book out and I'll read it and I'll say, look, well, this is what you've got to do. You know, I press that and there there it is. It's done. And you just you know, as a player, you you want someone to have been there and done it. Now I'm not I'm not disregarding it, like because there's there's room for everything. But when you get people, uh, especially at the low level, now I, like I said, being at Celtic now, it's a whole different ball game. You're working yeah. at the top level. I mean, I remember walking in there on the first day, and I was like, oh, my. Uh, I bring my boots, I bring my my shorts, I bring training kit, I bring everything, slips, every, yeah. like everything. Yeah. And I walked into my lock and. As my locker was there, then I had about 10 piles of clothes, brand new clothes, brand new boots. Brand, and I was like, oh, yeah, oh, wow, this, <laughs> God, this is what it's like. And I was thinking, okay, well, I'm going to have to bring a sandwich in to get something. Oh, no, we've got a canteen that's full of hot food. I was like, oh, wow. So it was amazing to like, to, yeah. you, you, you forget, you know, so it's, it's, it's completely different. Um, but like I said, it's, it's a hard thing for, like I said, I, that's one thing I do, I do struggle with. And it's not because of, um, it's not because of like, I, I don't get on well with them or anything like that. It's yeah, just that sometimes at that level there, people, especially uh, not the owners, but people in other roles are doing it for themselves. They're not doing it Man. for actually the, the club. Whereas when you work at a professional club, everyone is on the same page working for the same goal. And that's what you need. You need everyone yeah. on the same page. Yeah. Thanks for that, mate. Let's change tack a little bit. Have you? I'm guessing the answer to this question is no, based on what you've said. But I, I'm going to start by saying: Have you ever had a coaching mentor? Have you ever had anyone that you can turn around, whether that's from football or outside of football, that you can bounce ideas off or share things about how you you manage people and, and lead people, and, and not not obviously about the specifics of the game. You know that that bit inside out. I not not through coaching, not through football. I have other friends who are wealthy, are wealthy people and own their own businesses, and I bounce ideas off them. And that's speaking about well, how would you deal with that? You yeah, know, how would you deal? And so I, I, I get, I get that. But as far as doing it with the football stuff, no. So this role, when this came about with uh, the manager now, Celtic Ange, I think this is what I needed, you know, to to see what uh, what a top manager does. And to see how he handles certain things. So this is probably my first time where I've had someone really I can sit down with and and talk football. Don't get me wrong. I sit down with my son who thinks he knows everything about football. (laughs) And we argue. So, you know, he'll kill me for that, by the way. I'm sure. It's interesting, Hayes. Do you think that you, you see that if you'd have gone to Celtic as a player, do you think you'd have seen the same things that you see in Ange and admire in Ange that you now see uh, as a coach, the first team coach? No, because again, as a player, I would have been just focusing on my role. I wouldn't have been worried about anything else. I would have been just focusing on what I need to do to be at my best for my team and for my club to make sure I go out there and perform week in, week out. So that on a uh, on a uh, post-match uh analyzing i'm not the one getting picked out for not doing it right i'm the one that's getting picked out for doing it right so yeah. that's what i'd be focusing on so again i would not i would not have seen him as a player i i don't know what he would have been like if i was a player i can only tell you what he's like yeah as for me someone working with him yeah and that and that he, he obviously does his thing and, and it works fantastically well for him so there's a lot to admire about the way he goes about doing what he does yeah, and what I like about him mostly is because he's done it the hard way, you know, when no one's backed him, and I quite like that. Yeah. You know, it's it's that that Aussiness, that that toughness, that that bit of grit to to keep going and believe in yourself. Because you know, he's he's had times, he's had times where things weren't going well, yeah. but he's when you do listen to him, even after take like I wear a hat a lot anyway, but. I take my hat off to him because the way he talks, he's, I was, I'll go back. So when I first was going in there, it was like, wow, okay, I've got to, now I knew how we played. I, I, I knew how we played or roughly how we played. And I thought, okay, it was going to take me a couple of weeks to understand exactly what, what movements and all that. It took me two days. Now, like I said, I know football, I understand football very easy, but the way he makes it, explains it, 
yeah. the way he shows it, you you can't. It's it's simple. It's yeah. really simple. And it's it, it amazes me if you get it wrong because that means one, you're not listening. Because that's the only thing you have to do is listen, because that's how that's how easy he makes football. Yeah. Isn't that incredible that the best you, you mentioned Pep Guardiola <laughs> before you mentioned um, uh, Jurgen Klopp? They all seem to have that gift. They make the complex simple. Yeah, um, well, that's that's a big thing in football. Ooh. There's the the hardest thing to do in football is to play simple. You know, it's it's the game is to get the ball from A to B and get in, in into this little rectangle area. Right? It's funny when you think about it. And if one of your players are in an advanced position, just pass it to him. But no, I mean, the, the problem is is we have the human side of us that sometimes want to go for, go for that miraculous or skillful or deadly pass, you know, and you're sitting there scratching your head going, some of the best teams in the world, and you admire, you go, oh my God, Barcelona, when they were, you know, they, they would not give the ball away. Yeah, but they didn't give the ball away because they were passing 10 metres. Each time, and every time they had three passes, so it's 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 not hard because they play simple, yeah. and and that's what that's that's the the hardest thing to do in football is to play simple. I think that would be a great addition to all of the coaching licenses that that to just to educate coaches to make it as simple as you can, not as complex as you can. I, it, look in in football, there's you know as as a player, right? You got to learn to pass. You learn to strike a ball. You got to learn to head a ball. You learn to cross a ball, right? And and controllable. That is it, right? That's on the attacking side. And on the defensive side, you just need to know how to tackle. So there's not that many things that you actually need to know about this sport. But when you see sometimes people coming out there going bang, 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 laces, you're like, whoa, wow. <laughs> even though even sometimes I see it and I go, like, I I was a thinker, right? I was a thinker in football. But then yeah. sometimes I, you know, on my, on my journeys, I've seen drills and, and I'm sitting there going, I'm lost here. I yeah. don't even know. And, and you can see it in the players. Like I said, we want to be challenged, but we also want to make sure we're doing things that are going to improve us. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the, the key. If, if a manager was to tell you to say, look, you make sure you do this and you'll get, it's, it's a bit like Harland. You know, Pep Guardiola's turned around and said, you should stand here and you'll get your goals. Now, he's finding that difficult because he wants to touch the balls. But then two or three games in, he's getting hat tricks. He's thinking, oh, well, this is easy now. But that's how, because Pep makes it that easy because he says, just stand here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it, mate. I love it. Why do you do it? Why do you coach? Because I love it. I've I've tried. I've tried to to, to love other things as much like... I, I, I love cooking. Uh, I love golf. I love being at home. I love gardening, strangely enough. I love my laurel, who are, what are outside. I look after them. But it, it's not enough to look after them every single day. It's not, it's, 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 it's not enough for me to actually go and get proper cooking lessons. It's not enough for me to go and get an actual garden bed and actually grow them and look after them every day because I don't love it. Whereas football, I love. I just yeah. can't. I just can't get away from it. Yeah, that's great. On your playing career, playing career, Harry, you had um, more than your fair share of injuries. Probably, probably true, in, including your five years at Liverpool. Um, far too many injuries. And when you're a player, you can't play for your club team. You can't play for your national team. And and resilience is something that you just got to have. You have got to develop it and grow it. Um, when you step into the chair as a manager, you obviously need resilience as well because, uh, as you, I can't remember which manager it was, but said, you know, you don't you don't know what being a manager or coach is until you've been sacked. Um, but when that happens and the world comes tumbling down, it, it is, it's not that that's not easy. It, it really, really isn't easy. So, I'll finally get to a question here, Harry. <laughs> how how important is resilience for coaches? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, well, it's, it's, it's interesting because everyone's different as a coach. Mm. Um, I've spoken to, to managers that when they get the sack, they're like, ah, all right, see you later, go on. And they, they completely forget about it and they're not even fussed, you know, cause they don't take it to, to heart. But I know some managers that just think, oh my God, how's that possible? You know, they, 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 they take it to heart and, 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 and it really stays with them. Um, it's going to sound funny, but like I said, it, it hurt when I when I lost my first job and my second job. 
you really hurt because I'm sitting there going, like, what did you what did you expect? You were last position. I got you out of relegation, right? Then you sacked me. You brought a new manager in, and they got relegated. Yeah. Right? So how do you think I feel, right? Because everyone thinks oh, I failed. No, yeah. I, I didn't fail. I actually got you out of it. Then I go to another club and sit in there. I had four players at the start. You get into 16th. You're doing well. Yes, I lost every home game, but I won every away game. If that was reversed, everyone yeah. would be going, you're brilliant. You know, yeah. oh, if, you, if you could just get a point away from home. I was, I was one of the top goal scorers. Then they sacked me. And then now they're relegated. And so you're sitting there and, and it really hurts. Yeah. And then you go to another job to do it again. And by this time, yeah, I'm getting used to it now. So I kind of just think, <laughs> well, look, you know, like you said, you can't, you can't please skin. everybody. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think that, I think the important thing is, is like I said, I, I love coaching, but yeah. the, the one thing that I would say to a lot of young coaches out there is you have to pick the right job for you. Yeah. You know, sometimes if you're like me, you think the impossible can be done, which that's how I've always been in my life. I think, you know, I can do it. I know I can do it. But then I just need a little bit more time. You know, yeah. people want, you know, as soon as, soon as you get a club, you, 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 it's like, I always say, it's like planting a tree. As soon as you plant a tree, it doesn't spring its flowers straight away. You know, it, it takes six months or a year to actually see it start to bloom. But some some owners want it straight away. Oh, well, yeah. You, yeah, you just planted it yesterday. Where's the flowers? Come on. Yeah. And that's, it, it, it can't be done. You know, so for me, it's, I've learned better because I've had experience of of getting sacked. It's not it's, it's it's actually not a nice feeling because you then question yourself because you're thinking, "Well, I'm good at this," you know. I mean, when I, when I speak to like players, and you know, and and then that's another thing I I always go when I when I went to my last job interview, I always I said to the owner, I said, "You always when you ask about managers, why do you always speak to agents or why do you always speak to sporting directors?" And he goes, well, I don't know. It's what, it's what we do. I said, yeah, but they've never seen me coach, right? Yeah. Never seen, like, in a sporting director, like, are they your friends or are they not? What, why are you speaking yeah. to an agent that's never yeah. even spoke to me, right? Yeah. He's never seen me. I said, why don't you actually ring players? Because a player, whether he likes you or not, he will tell you the truth. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, if an owner rang me now and said, what is this player like? Because he respects me in my, in my thoughts. So I'd be going, well, this is what he's like. That's yeah. a lot more than... An agent or a sporting director. Oh, okay, well let, let's let's just take him. You know, so I, I I never understood that. But I would say make sure you, if you're getting a job, make sure it's right for you because sometimes some jobs out there are just impossible. Yeah, Harry, just to stay on the resilience thing for a little bit. Do you do you, do you think at at the elite end of football where you are now with Celtic that managers need to teach players how to develop resilience or do you think it's a matter of the good ones have got it and that they're going to rise to the top we don't have time we don't have time to develop resilience in so many other ones i think as a coach or a manager you should always be trying to improve a player you know whether it's that half a percent or five percent i think at every any any moment that's why you're there not only to to win games, but you're there to improve players, you know, because even if you can improve a person, that person is going to improve as a player. Yeah. So for me as a coach is that you make the person happy, he's going to want to be a better player. And every every team, every every top manager does that, you know. He will have rules, he'll have ways of playing, you know, and this is what he wants. And in, in, in a way that is actually setting the player up to have that resilience. You know, because there is no failure, you know. The, I, I, I hear a lot of people, you know, we don't talk about failure because failing is actually not failing. Failing is, is, is attempting to do something and you've just, you just messed up. That's, yeah. not a, that's not failure. That's actually someone with courage. Yeah. And I love that. And I, 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 I like people failing because I think you've actually stepped out and you made your circle that little bit bigger because you tried something. Now let's go and work on that. So next time yeah. you do it, guess what? You're going to do it. And that's actually bringing someone stronger into the into your club and making them a better player, and making your team better. Yeah, no, I like that as well. So, H, what have been some of your most enjoyable moments thus far in your coaching journey? Um, 
when your team scores, that's a big thing. That's just like when you scored. You know, when uh, when you scored a goal, it was like this feeling that you have. And people always said, well, what's it like? I don't know. I don't know what it's like. It's just this this, this buzz. It's fantastic. <laughs> and I thought that I thought that was lost until my team scored their first goal when I was at Crawley. And that thing just erupted. And it was like, oh, it's like you scored. <laughs> Yeah. Like your team scored and it's like you scored, but in a way you have scored because it's your ideas. And this is what I'm saying. If you go there and just say to the players, play, right? And they play and they score, you're not going to get that. But if you've worked on something all preseason, all week and all that, or leading up to a game and you can see it, it's amazing. It's one of the best feelings in the world that you've convinced, you know, uh, your football team to cross a white line and you've taught them ideas throughout the whole week and they've gone out there and executed them perfect and they've got their rewards, right? And they're, they're, they're all celebrating all that. But like I said, you're, you're down this and there. Yes, that's, <laughs> yes, that's what it is. Now, I've got to ask you this. So is that feeling as good as how you felt when you scored that goal for Leeds United against Arsenal? Again, I, I, I know it's going to sound crazy. I know it's going to sound crazy to a lot of things, but I absolutely love coaching more than I played. Is that right? Because I, yeah, I. That's what I said. It's 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 a crazy thing, and people may say, "Oh no, it's crazy," because the rules are: is like if you can't be a player, you be a coach. If you can't be a coach, you be a referee. If you can't be a referee, you be a linesman. If you can't be a linesman, well, that's it. Don't even don't even be it. But like I said, I've always been that player that when you've played with me, I, I was always talking. You know, I probably got, I probably annoyed a lot of players as well because I'd always tell them, no, stay there, Shh, no, you move here, ladies. When my, when my fullback used to come bombing around me, I used to put a big hand up and say, stop, where are you going? <laughs> stay there, right? You know, I don't need you to go around me. That's my job, right? And and so even when now I talk to my wingers, I, I'm like, I was ruthless. Like I, I, I did what I had to do to get the best out of my players and my team. And this is what I try to now do because my role is slightly different now. I am a coach where I go there and I can give individual information to a player. And I can see certain players in that team that have the ability to do what I did. You know, if not, they can do it better. So now I've got the, the chance to work on them. But like I said, to give them little bits of information to say, hey, you've got to demand, right? You've got to demand the ball. You've got to be able to put people in their place. Now, this this is not a thing that, they're going to argue with you after you're doing the right thing for the team. Right. And you've got to be able to be confident enough to do that because people are looking at you to, to win the game. And this is how you, this is how you do it. Yeah. And no, I thank, thanks for that, Harry. We're on the downhill run here. We're on, we're on the clock. And I know, cause I know you've got to, uh, you've got to do a couple of other things. So um, what does success look like? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I, don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I don't well, honestly. What, what is my success? Is it, is it the player my, score in the goal? Is my success, the, my success, and your success is completely different. Absolutely. You know, in everyone's success, you know, everyone thinks you know maybe winning winning this is successful. You know, you know, winning the competition is yes, that's the thing. I think you can enjoy it, but. I don't know. I, success to me is competing at the highest level against the best possible people ever and competing against them. And if you can be successful against them, I think you can look back and go, well, at least I've mixed it with the big boys. Yeah. That's what I, That's how I see it. Uh, I like that. Thanks for that, Harry. Okay, final one. If you have one piece of wisdom you could share to coaches, whether they were at the beginning of their journey, in the middle or close to the end, one piece of wisdom about coaching, what would that be? Be yourself. Because like I said before, I said, if you if you take ideas from another coach, another formation from another coach, and you try to implement that style because that coach does it and he's very successful at it, and you can't quite hit that marker or you think you're hitting that marker, players will see through you and that's when you lose players but if you are yourself and you believe in your style then players will believe it as well mm -hmm.